Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Health Leader Forge is a production of the University of New Hampshire's College of Health and Human Services. For this first episode of Health Leader Forge, I will be interviewing Michael Ferrara, the Kent P. Falb Professor of Kinesiology and the Dean of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire. As you will soon hear, Dean Ferrara's career is a blend of award-winning practitioner, world-class researcher, policy influencer, and healthcare leader. It is also with his support that this podcast is being produced. Welcome to The Forge, Dean Farrar. I thought we'd start by talking about your kind of your background, how you got involved in, in sports medicine. Mm-hmm. What, what was it that interested you about it? Did you play a lot of sports in high school, play in college? What was it that brought you to the field? So actually I was a pretty decent athlete growing up. I played hockey, uh, baseball, and football. As at the time we did three sports wow. instead of uh, specializing as yeah. a lot of kids do today. Uh, my best sport was ice hockey. I actually got recruited to Ithaca College uh, to play hockey there. And then um, played some. Uh, actually didn't play hockey. I actually went and played football okay. for a year. Played baseball for a couple of years and then got involved in uh, the injury side of it. I oh, okay. uh, went to a meeting and that was about the time in the 1970s um, where athletic training was really starting to develop as a profession. Okay. And at the time, there are two routes to credentialing or certification. One route was an internship route where you mostly learned on the job. And the other route was an academic route or a curriculum route where you took courses plus learned on the job. And Ithaca had one of the few programs in athletic training that had a curriculum route. At the undergraduate level. At the undergraduate level. Now, okay. of course, you fast forward that 30 years to now, and everything is a curriculum. Everything is an academic major. Uh, we have one here in athletic training at UNH, uh, which is an undergraduate major in our Department of Kinesiology. Okay. And nationally, there's probably about 350 or 360 uh, accredited athletic training education programs. So if a, if a student was to come here to go to kinesiology, majored mm-hmm. in kinesiology, majored in uh, athletic training, they would get a bachelor's degree in athletic training. Correct. And then go on, and what kind of career does, is that a, is that a career entry level education, or, yep. or do you still have, you need to get a master's? Depends what level you want to work. Okay. Uh, so if, you, if your goal is to work in college or university, typically mm-hmm. you have to have a master's degree. And so like myself, a lot of people will be hired as graduate assistant athletic trainers. You do your education while you're gaining more clinical experience, and then you would move right into the workforce. Uh, high school levels are, can be either bachelor's or master's. And same thing in the clinical field. So if you're working for a hospital, sports medicine center, et cetera, it can be either a bachelor's or master's. So you kind of, in, in, as an undergrad, you made that decision. Did you have, yeah. did you see a mentor or somebody that, you know, you really said, wow, this guy's doing something really cool or gal? It's well, I had a lot of great mentors. Yeah. Uh, Kent Scriber, who was uh-huh. the director of athletic training at Ithaca College, was a great mentor and a wonderful friend. He's, yeah. in fact, retiring uh, this year from Ithaca after a long and wow. storied career. And so so you saw he, what they were doing and got right, interested. Right, right, and I knew at you know at that time I wanted to work in a college university setting, okay. and so I had to go get my master's degree. I chose Michigan State, and it's kind of an interesting story. I was a senior at Ithaca, and I wanted to go to the national meeting, the okay. National Athletic Trainers Association. That year, they held their meeting in Philadelphia. And so as a young student, I didn't have much money, and I drove down to Philadelphia. I didn't have a place to live. Yeah. And I met students from Michigan State, and we hit it off. And so they introduced me to their um, staff, and then we hit it off and it ended up working out. So That's I actually great. applied to five different okay. schools for my master's degree, and um, my top choice was always Michigan State. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I had a, had a great experience there. One year I worked at the high school as an athletic trainer. Second year I did uh, soccer and lacrosse at, at, at uh, MSU. In fact, my wife and I got married on the campus of MSU. <laughs> Is that right? All right. Well, that's a neat connection back to the, to, to the school. So you were there in the early 80s. Right. And you were the, you were the athletic trainer for several major festivals. Um, 
And then you were the trainer for the U.S. National Ice Hockey Team in 82, 83. That yeah. sounds pretty exciting. It was a great trip. Yeah. And so you remember we won some medal in 1980 I, I in Lake Placid. That, that, that miracle on ice. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. And yeah. so uh, for the 83, 84 team, uh -huh. uh, the goal was to get ready for the 84 Olympics. Okay. And so it was a preparatory uh, tour. And we had a lot of the same folks from the 80 team at Craig and Verkota and Harrington, Wells, and mm -hmm. uh, the list goes on and on. It was, it was really a wonderful team. Yeah. Uh, won the gold medal uh, yeah. the, in the uh, world championships were in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, it was a neat Neat experience, especially yeah. I was just a young athletic trainer at the time. I was only yeah. 25, and you know, here I had one of the marquee, you know, experiences. Yeah. And you know, it was kind of the right place, right time, uh, kind of thing. I was like, as I mentioned, I was at Michigan. Well, how did you get there? I mean, how? Did, so how did, it, when I was at Ithaca, I had met. I went to a meeting, uh -huh, okay. <laughs> and I met another athletic trainer who told me about his experience at Colorado Springs in, at the United States Olympic Training Center. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked, "How do you do that?" Yeah. And so he said, "You got to submit this application and, and do all." All that and so I did and so in between the summer before I started at Michigan State mm -hmm. uh, I got called to do my two-week internship mm -hmm. in Colorado Springs mm -hmm. and so during that time I had men's uh, water polo and men's field hockey and so I obviously and they evaluate you during a time for your clinical skills your ability to work with people mm -hmm. ability to work in crisis situations all those kinds of different attributes and I got selected to work the 82 uh, Olympic Festival. So the Olympic Festival at the time was a kind of a Olympic style games mm -hmm. and it was north, south, east and west and they would just compete in various things. Mm -hmm. uh, and during that time I had the men's gymnastics team and work with them and actually during that time they were, moved, they were um, doing very well in gymnastics. Uh, 83 I get got to go to the World University Games in Edmonton, uh, Canada. And again, I had men's, men's gymnastics. And during that time, I got the call from the USOC and said, would you be willing to do it? And I was actually at Michigan State at grad school. Fortunately, they were on quarters. And so I took the winter quarter off. I left on Christmas Day and came back on April 1st. And I just overloaded my credits to to graduate on time. So you were the athletic trainer for, for a variety of different teams. I'm not a clinician, so right. to tell me, tell us a little bit about what does it, what does an athletic trainer do, especially at that level of performance. So essentially, we're responsible for the prevention, the treatment, care, and rehabilitation of injuries. Okay. And so, if you were to injure your ankle or your knee, uh, we would do the initial assessment. We would probably uh, provide the initial treatment, uh, make a decision if it needs referral to a physician, if mm -hmm. it, you know, if we can handle it uh, as you know internally, mm -hmm. and to start the rehabilitation program to get you on the road to recovery. So it's a, it's a mixed kind of skill set that you've it's, got to it's, have. Right, and you've got to yeah. be able to work with people. And okay. so you're working with coaches, you're working with athletes, you're working with administrators, uh, parents. And yeah. so it's it's a challenging position, but it's a ton of fun. Yeah, I bet. And, and I've had a, you know. And you probably get great seats. Well, yeah, you're right <laughs> on the sideline. You're exactly right. Yeah. As long yeah. as you pay attention because those athletes come off fast on the yeah. football field. Yeah, or, right. Uh, yeah. Or same any sport, yeah, but you, right, sure. yeah, yeah, neat. So after you finished your time at, at Michigan, you got a job at Ball State as a professor of physical education and to be the coordinator of the athletic training and the director of the athletic training laboratory. Right. Um, you, you went there in '85, stayed there till '98. So what was that like? What was so I made at that time I made the switch. Mm -hmm. um, from the clinical side to the teaching side. Uh, I come from a family of teachers. My dad was a music teacher, and so um, I wanted to try the teaching side of it. Yeah. And so Ball State had a position open for a program director of athletic training, and I applied for it and, yeah. and got it. Great. And, and so that's how I embarked on my academic career. At the okay. time, I only had my master's degree, and so I was getting their program. I was working through accreditation to make sure we were uh, accredited and doing the day-to-day -day things to uh, run the program and you know one of my passions is just working with students and, okay. and that was that was good I also had a clinical assignment with baseball at the time in addition to running with uh, or running the AT program okay nice so during this time you, you mentioned you had your your masters but you started a PhD at Penn State right and eventually, now what did you actually get your PhD in? So I got it in sport epidemiology. And so way back in the 70s, there's, uh -huh. there's a program called NARES, National Athletic Injury Reporting System. And it's a reporting system that was used for the NCAA. So Penn State was one of the leaders in sport epidemiology, which is what I wanted to uh, study and worked on under uh, Dr. Bill Buckley, 
He was my major major okay. professor. Yeah, and so during this time, while you were at Ball State, you got really involved in um, athletic events for disabled athletes, right. and, and you were involved in a, a whole slew of, of interesting sounding events. You were the co-director of the National Wheelchair Athletic Association Elite Training Camp, uh, athletic trainer for uh, the World Championships and Games for the Disabled. Um, you were ultimately the director of medical services for the U.S. Disabled Sports Team and the 1992 Paralympic uh, Team. And, and then during this period, uh, you had, uh, and much of your kind of early published mm -hmm. research was concerned with athletes with disabilities. Yep. I think you published somewhere around 19 uh, peer reviewed yep. articles, yep. Uh, which is huge. So, tell, why are uh, athletic programs for the disabled important? So, it actually developed, I was uh, chair of a search committee for adapted PE. Okay. position at Ball State. And what does and, that mean, adapted PE? Uh, uh, physical education for people with disabilities. Okay. Uh, so they would train teachers and how to teach uh, okay. physical education. Um, and so the person we hired was Dr. Ron Davis, who was very involved in sport for people with disabilities. And we formed that relationship, and that's how I ended up in uh, sport for people with disabilities. My dissertation was, really, was doing an injury epidemiology study uh, on athletes with disabilities. We did first a retrospective six-month study, mm -hmm. and then we did a prospective three-year study, athletes with dis uh, disabilities injury, injury registry, which was funded uh, by the USOC. And so I had the research side going, and during my uh, dissertation research, the United States Cerebral Palsy Association said, we're happy to participate in your research, but we want you to present to our sports medicine committee. Okay. And so up I flew from uh, Penn State to Detroit, Michigan to meet with their sports medicine committee, and they found out about my previous experience with the Olympics. Okay. And so working with the uh, Olympic Sports Festival, the Pan Am Games, the World University Games that we talked about before, yeah. and they asked, yeah. Would you be interested in going to the World Championships in Austin? I said, sure, I'd yeah. love to go. <laughs> and, and so off I went. Uh -huh. And uh, for sports for athletes with disabilities, there's five different organizations. And so there's um, blind and visually impaired, there's cerebral palsy, uh, spinal cord injured, ampute amputee, and dwarf were, okay. the f were the five major groups. And what it turned out when I got to Austin is each group had their own medical staff. And each group treated their own athletes. And being a newbie on the block, I said, this doesn't make sense. We, uh -uh. Sh we should integrate our services. We can provide much greater services together rather than trying to do things. In a silo. Kind of, right. Exactly. And so that's how I ended up in those leadership positions. We were able okay. to uh, integrate some of those services in the 90 games, 1990 games. Uh, did the same thing with the uh, Paralympic trials in 91 and then, you know, the and the 92 games in Barcelona. So Barcelona, we were a medical staff of 25-ish, 25, 25 to 30 uh, people for mm -hmm. close to a team size of 600 wow. uh, altogether. That's a, that's a lot of, so that's a fairly it's, low it's, ratio. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of people. You know, we had, you know, we have physicians, we had athletic trainers, we have physical therapists, uh, we have people in wheelchair, uh, orthotic uh, repair, we brought a sports psychologist with us. Uh, so we were all part of the uh, the medical team. We covered mm -hmm. all. You know, we had somebody at every sport, uh, and then and, spread you, and you were actually the director of the whole right. So I was operation. right. I was in charge in the administration and overseeing mm -hmm. the entire operation. Uh, Dr. Greg Palutzis, who was from Northwestern University uh, in Chicago, was our medical director, and so he and I would work together in putting okay. together the plan. And, and when we had you know things that happened, which we did. Yeah. Um, you know we worked together and on solving the problems from a yeah. healthcare perspective. Yeah. So when you worked with and that's interesting observation about the the silos. I mean that's a common organizational right. problem, right? Right. Is people kind of get siloed in and, right. and they and they and they fail to take advantage of these you know synergies that are obviously there. Did you have any resistance to that? I mean was it? Well, of course it, there is. Yeah. I mean, okay. But again, you know, you you. you we talk through the issues, you know, and my philosophy, and again, I was a neophyte at the time, yeah. that if you know injuries, you can treat anybody. Yeah. Yes, you need to know the specifics for a disability, but we could teach you that. You know, so, you know, for example, CP, cerebral palsy, you know, had certain types of things. Those with spinal cord injured had certain types 
of problems. And so you would work through, and we actually developed a booklet uh, that was written by the team in terms of training others so they can work from a cross-disability uh, perspective. Are there specializations now in um, athletic training programs for working with, no. with people with disabilities? Not, no, not, not specifically. Really. Not specifically, yeah. but, but is it something that's part of a curriculum, generally speaking? It's, or? You know, it was part of the units, uh -huh. uh, but okay. it's, it's not a specific f focus. Okay. okay, just curious. So you, what do you think in terms of research? You did a lot of research on, on you know, uh, mm -hmm. in dealing with injuries uh, for people with right. disabilities, performance issues. How did our understanding of athletes with disabilities change during this period? I think there, I'm, I'm, I think mm -hmm. there was a lot of change going on. In, in well, that there's, period. you know, probably always. Well, well there's sociological yeah. changes, there's uh -huh. societal changes. Uh -huh. um, I, I think basically what we're trying to promote is sport is safe. I mean, you can develop the paradigm mm -hmm. in order for everybody to participate in sport and participate yeah. safely. And so what we did with a couple of our projects was just describe what are some of the common injuries that you would expect to see in certain populations. So for example, uh, some of our blind and visually impaired uh, athletes tend to have lower extremity problems. So if you think about it, if you take vision away, what do you have to rely upon to help you as you navigate walking and running, yeah, yeah. right? It's your feet, your right. proprioceptive system. Right. And so the way you hit the ground biomechanically changes a little bit versus those who have vision. So yeah. it, it changes the focus uh, a little bit. Obviously with those with spinal cord injured, you know, there's a lot of upper extremities, a lot of shoulder, a lot of elbow, a lot of wrist. Makes sense, doesn't right, it? Sure, sure. Uh, and, and so, but we're, what we were able to do is actually put data uh -huh. to show what we thought was actually happening uh, in the field. And we had a series of, I think, three or four papers on the epidemiology of sport injuries. Okay. And how has that affected the field? How has that affected training since, since that research was done? So I, I think, again, you know, working with our coaches, you can mm -hmm. de de design safe training programs and you can begin to emphasize what groups you should strengthen from an injury prevention okay. standpoint. So if you know or expect a certain population to have you know, upper extremity or shoulder issues, then we can work on an upper extremity program as part of the normal training okay. to reduce the uh, injury. So the, the vision of the IPC uh, was to enable Paralympic athletes to achieve sporting excellence and inspire and excite the world. What do you think of, of, of that mission? I think it's great. The yeah. International Paralympic Committee is the, is the sister organization to the IOC. And I actually served on the IPC Sports Science uh, Committee for eight or nine years, I can't remember which, mm -hmm. uh, in trying to promote uh, sport for people with disabilities. And that's one of the great things about UNH is we have the Northeast Passage, okay. uh, which is very much the same thing, promoting sport and physical activity okay. uh, for people with disabilities, promoting a healthy lifestyle across the spectrum. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be elite sport. I right. Mean, it could be, you know, just participating in regular recreational activities. The whole spectrum, because health and physical activity is so important to, yeah. uh, to our health. Is, is what we learn with elite athletes helpful to just the ordinary people? I mean, if you think of it globally, mm -hmm. I mean, not just with people with disabilities, but globally, a lot of times elite sport trickles mm -hmm. down uh, to college and high school sport or to yeah. other, or recreational participants. And it works for some and it doesn't work for others. Okay. Because uh, pro athletes are different, right? I mean, sure. they're, they're bigger, faster, stronger. And to be a pro athlete, you have to be a motor genius. Okay. You could put your... What does that mean? Well, you could, a, a pro athlete puts their bodies in places and space the rest of us can't do. We can't throw a fastball 95 miles an hour. You know, they have the gifts to coordinate all the different actions to be able to do that. A person to run a 4-240 has the gifts yeah. to do that. I mean, so your pro athletes have made their way upwards and you know, essentially, they're they're a motor genius. They're able okay. to put their bodies neat, in places. That, yeah. Right, they're, yeah. they're, they put their bodies in places and space that the rest of us can't. I mean, I, I yeah. could throw a fastball. I can't do it more than eighty or eighty-five miles an hour. I just don't have the the motor pattern and the ability yeah. to fire my muscles in sequence okay. in order to make that happen. And yes, there's some training to make it better, but you got to have the genetic, to some degree, the genetic make yeah. to make it work. Uh, you know, if you look at pro football, to be a lineman, you got to be Six, six, five, six, four, whatever, and yeah. three hundred pounds, and right. be able to run fast. And if you're five eight like me, you're right, you're not right, right, alignment, right, exactly. Right? <laughs> you know, and so just, I mean, no again, how much you practice, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then if you take it down each level, yeah. I mean, it, it, everything moves down sequentially.
so you, you worked with um, uh, disability, uh, and then in 1998 you moved to the University of Georgia to be the professor, program head, and director of the St. Mary's Hospital Athletic Training Research and Educational Laboratory. So uh, was Georgia a big change from Indiana? So it was a big change. So let's go back up a step. Yeah, in 1995-96, sure. mm -hmm. I was director of medical operations for the Atlanta Paralympic Organizing Committee. So if you remember, we talked earlier about yeah. 92 was for Team USA. So in 96, Atlanta was hosting the Olympics and Paralympic Games. Right. So my charge was to develop a health care plan or medical plan for the entire games. Wow. Okay. And so I was working, my co uh, uh, cohort was Dr. Robert Wells, who's a medical director, and then I was the director of medical operations. And so we had to put together not only a plan for our athletes, uh, but for spectators, for VIP, for guests, the entire uh, plan. We had some 35 to 40 so this venues. was not just athletes, this was no, this whole, is, yeah, this is medical. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and we went through disaster training okay. with FEMA and uh -huh. GEMA, the yep. Federal Emerging Management Association, the Georgia Emerging Management Association. We actually did a drill prior to the games yeah. uh, where they brought in all the different functional groups and they put us in this big room and they put each of the functional areas in their room and they ran a disaster scenario through to see how everybody would react, how the systems would communicate. And during the 90s, this was kind of pre-cell phone mm -hmm. era. I mean, the cell phones were just starting yeah. to yeah, come. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, my cell phone was probably about a foot and a half <laughs> high. About, you yeah, know, it's six, a brick, Yeah, right? and, and the battery is maybe 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, which is way different than what uh, we have yeah, yeah. Uh, now. So communication is, you know, is a challenge. And yeah. so, you know, we had to do everything from a disaster planning mass casualty, casualty event to the simple sprain and strain that wow. somebody may get or you know, sunburn from sitting in the, in the bleachers. And, and so we staffed all the different uh, competition and training venues. We had uh, ambulance at our high profile or high risk uh, events. Uh, we developed a hospital support network. Okay. And so we had hospitals ad adopt venues and we used them to help uh, provide equipment supply as well as for their, their staffs to volunteer. I mean, yeah. it's a great event uh, to participate in. Sure. And that's the neatest part was just meeting all the different people from across the world, but just all the folks from Atlanta. And so during my time there, I got to know some of the people from the University of Georgia, mm -hmm. and specifically Ron Corson, uh, who was the director of the sports medicine program. And he called me up one day and said, we're starting a athletic training education program. Would you be interested? Neat. So I oh, said, okay. sure. And I threw my name in the hat, and uh, they offered us the position. Yeah. Uh, we all liked our time in Atlanta, and so we made the move to Athens in 98. Great. Let's talk a little bit about, before, so before we talk a little more about your, your Georgia experience, let's, let's talk a little bit about, well, your Georgia experience being the, 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 at the Paralympics. Um, you were talking about a couple of times now about the roles of uh, uh, the director, um, the kind of administrative mm -hmm. uh, director, and the chief medical officer right. or medical director. And this is a common kind of matrix issue that shows up in a lot of right. medical organizations, right? right? You kind of have a, a co-lead. Mm -hmm. So how, how does that, talk a little bit about what makes a relationship like that effective? When, is it, when does it work? What has to be done to make sure that... that well, I, I was lucky in both situations. Uh, Dr. Plutus in 92 and Dr. Wells in 96, both were outstanding people who were grounded in doing the best thing for the athlete or for the population. And so because we both came from similar philosophies and trying to do the same thing, there was very, very little conflict. Okay. Um, you know, our goal was to provide the best medical environment, whether it be the 92 or the 96 games, and it's just mm -hmm. figuring out how do we get there? You know, what do we need to put in place in order for that to happen? So in, in 92, one of the things that we did, no one ever done for the games before, uh, a pre-medical history. Okay. You know, so because each of the groups, again, took care of themselves, so there's right. never a coordinated event. And uh -huh. so by doing that, you know, we had a medical history in all 500 plus Athletes, and it actually helped us in a couple of cases, and you know where we had injuries or in identifying uh, potential problems. And I think so you could anticipate it. Anticipate well. things, mm -hmm. and in fact, I think, and, and I can't remember specifically, but I think there's one case we ruled out 
because of a variety of mitigating circumstances, we deem them not medically eligible okay. to participate. So um, they could have come and been injured, but you were able to because right. of your pre-screening. Right. Yeah. So through your pre-screening, we're able to yeah. alleviate those problems. Yeah. Great. Um, so I think, you know, the bottom line is just working with people, you know, having that common vision uh, of where you want to go and then figuring yeah. out the path. Uh, yeah. to so get you there. must have invested a fair amount of time in kind of developing that common vision to make sure that you exactly. you both saw things right. the way t the, together as, as a unit, uh -huh. and then that vision has to fit into the the bigger unit, sure. which is either the ninety two games right. or Olympic Paralympic team right. or the uh, Paralympic Games in ninety six. Okay. So you did eventually take the job at the University of Georgia, and. I saw in your in your CV kind of a, a fairly major shift in yep. your research, right? You went from looking at disability and athletes with disability, and you started looking at the issue of concussion. And you published about, I think, 24 peer-reviewed articles on concussion, which is, again, a, a huge uh, amount of uh, research. So I'm curious, how did you get interested in this topic, and why is it important? So. In 1998, concussion wasn't what it is in 2015. I mean, now you look at the papers every day, you can read some about concussion. Back in 1998, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a big, as big an issue as it was at the time. And so working with Ron Corson and I, we decided we wanted to pursue this with our student athletes at University of Georgia. How can we do a better job of evaluating sport-related concussion? And because at the time, it's all very subjective. So a head injury is much different than an ankle or knee injury. An ankle or knee injury, I can put my hands on you. I, I can feel or palpate the ligament structure, the muscle structure. I could do an MRI on you. I could do a variety of different things. I could see the damage. Mm -hmm. I can see if you're limping or not limping. With a head, it's much different. You know, you, the physical signs and symptoms are much are masked to a degree. They're not as outward, okay. and we rely much more on subjective response. What you tell me, I, mean, I can't measure if you have a headache. Right. You, you have to tell me you have to have and you I, have a headache. And you I have to tell me how bad it, it is. Right. 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 And, I mean, I, and what I think is terrible you right. may I'm, not be as bad for somebody else. And obviously, sure. if someone's knocked out, that's. Pretty straightforward. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know, if someone has amnesia or the inability to remember uh -huh. events, that's pretty straightforward. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of times in boxing or MMA, you'll see people get hit in the head, and yeah. you'll just look at their eyes, and you know nobody's home. Those right. are fairly straightforward. But what do you do with the, I don't want to say minor, but the lesser injuries, yeah. which are not as overt, mm -hmm. and how do you assess those? And so we went down a path of developing a paradigm mm -hmm. of assessing our concussions. And we okay. did it a three-step approach. One is we developed a symptom uh, inventory, and we borrowed from the University of Pittsburgh's inventory at the time. We did a battery of neuropsychological tests, which at the time were done by pen and paper. And we had a neuropsychologist student who was working with us on that. And then we did balance measures okay. uh, using something called a neurocomp. And so we put those three pieces of the puzzle together mm -hmm. and help us make better return to play decisions. Okay. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it at the time was just, you know, we were learning as we go. And when you say it's return to play, you mean you getting got back on, on the, the field, field right? Hit on the head somehow or other. And right. Can you go back in? Can, can, when, when is it safe for you to go back okay. to play? Okay. Um, and so we were trying to piece all that together. And, you know, our model, you know, the, the three pieces always stayed the same. The testing model, when we did things, the different types of tests evolved over time. And so, um, you know, we got more sophisticated mm -hmm. the more we learned over yeah. time. So recently, uh, obviously, in the last couple of years, we're hearing a lot about NFL players. And right. Talk a little bit about that and, you know, how is your research reflected in that kind of... Um, so, again, the NFL, I mean, you have the, um, the lawsuit with the NFL, mm -hmm. there's the NCAA lawsuit mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. Uh, I, I think we're get, doing a better job of recognizing and evaluating concussion. The big question out there mm -hmm. is what do you do with subconcussive blows? Okay. I don't, what is that? So a subconcussive blow is something that doesn't give you outward sy symptoms, okay. but like take an offensive or defensive lineman. Yeah. Every play, yeah. they're banging yeah. heads, okay. right? Uh -huh. So they're hitting, they're hitting. And it's, that's just part of the play. Right. right. What do you do? And mm -hmm. does it have any long-term so when you Effects. say subconcussive, you mean it's not quite a concussion. Correct. But you're getting whacked on the head. Correct. I mean, it's, it, you have it's no, repeatedly. You have no signs or symptoms, uh -huh. uh, at least that one that you're reporting, uh, yeah. but you keep getting these blows, and, and, you, and you hit your head every day, yeah. right? Yeah. So every day you have contact practice, every game that you have, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think of an NFL athlete, you know, 
you think they started in grade school, elementary yeah. school, eight high school, school whatever. Like that, right? You know, and you just mm -hmm. take that the number of exposures. You know, so they've been exposed eight, ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty years. Yeah. You know, that's a long time of exposure of hitting yeah. your head uh, repeatedly. Repeatedly against something, <laughs> right? And then obviously, when you get to the pro level, again, yeah. you know, it's faster speeds, yeah. more velocity. Yeah. You know, a variety of I've different. Heard it com compared to like a low speed collision in your car. Right. You know, and so there's some devices out there uh, that measure the actual uh, forces from contact. Okay. You know, one of the neat things here is uh, Dr. Eric Schwartz in our kinesiology department has come up with a program where he's taking the, the head out of contact. And so he's teaching our athletes not to make your head the point of contact, but rather your shoulder. And so from a preventative measure, because uh, 10 years ago we were taught, hit what you see. Yeah. So you stick your head and you lead yeah. forward with it. And now yeah. we're saying, don't do that. Lead with your shoulder. And we've always tried to do that over all the years, not to yeah. hit with your head um, mm -hmm. and to lead with your shoulder. So Eric devised this program. We took the helmet off the players, oh. taught them proper tackling and techniques or blocking techniques, eliminating the head from the force. So what, what are you seeing? With, what, what are we seeing with the long-term effects? And, you know, what well, is, there, there are some studies that suggest, mm -hmm. suggest uh, relationship to uh, dementia, to Alzheimer's disease, yeah. to a um, uh, variety of other uh, long-term uh, chronic diseases. Um, and the research is moving. There's a neat study that I believe, I can't remember who's doing it. Uh, we're looking at the same thing from the NFL study where they showed you know, depression and Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Does the same thing happen in the college population? So, you know, we, we know there's some linkage mm -hmm. or potential linkage here. Mm -hmm. It's that same linkage at the high school or at the college population. So that'll be something that'll be coming out in the next five to seven years or so, or maybe even sooner. So this is a great example of how research actually changes policy. Well, changes change. Exactly. Yeah. So right now we have all 50 states have a concussion policy. And it's mostly geared at the high school and lower athlete, but mostly at the high school mm -hmm. athlete. Three basic premises behind the... Uh, policy and it's called the Zachary Lysett Law. It was named after uh, a football player from the state of Washington. Uh, step number one is you have to ed educate everybody about concussion. Mm -hmm. Athletes, coaches, parents. Step two, if you have a concussion, you're removed from play the same day. So you can't return on the day that you're injured. And step three is you have to be cleared by a healthcare provider, whether that's a physician, uh, athletic trainer, a physician assistant, uh, there needs to be some evaluation that says, yes, Mark, yeah. you're cleared, you're recovered, yeah. you can go back and return to play. And so all 50 states have um, the same basic premises uh, for the concussion law. I'm curious, uh, do, would you support something uh, or, or a policy that says it can't be the team trainer that says you're cleared to go back, but somebody who's independent of the team? Like, it, Could there possibly, I mean, you've yeah, signed that I, role. Is yeah, there a yeah, conflict yeah. of interest I, I, to, to letting the... Um, I, I don't believe so. No. I don't think there's, there's a, a professional. Yes. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't say, we've really got to no. win this game. And no. Get that guy no. back. Our, our goal is, is the student athlete or right. whatever level right. it is, right. is their health and safety. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't see that conflict of interest. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I think the biggest thing uh, is just the identification. Okay. So if you don't happen to see the hit, someone's tapping on the shoulder and saying, Mike, number 50 got hit really hard, you need to evaluate them. Okay. You know, that's where I think things are moving along positively, yeah. where you yeah. kind of have the eye in the sky, if you will, okay. uh, that, sure. can, that yeah. can help you see things that you may not see uh, when you're on the sideline. But bottom line for, for athletic trainers and for all health care professionals is that student athlete. So you started to do some some other research and so I, you, you mentioned this to me the other day so I, I bring this up because I did um, Army basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia mm -hmm. uh, in July and August uh, of 1989 and I came from New Hampshire right. directly <laughs> off the plane into Atlanta and then trucked out to, to Fort Benning and um, that was a you new and unique experience mm -hmm. to, to, to experience the heat and humidity of midsummer Georgia. And what you were looking at was um, you know, the effects of, of uh, exertional heat illness on high school preseason acclimatization rules. Right. And obviously this, this has a, you know, this kind of research, much like, actually much like the concussion research that we were doing, would be of interest mm -hmm. to, the, to the military because um, you know, we deal with, uh, we clearly we deal with this kind of climate issue and taking people from, say, New York State and mm -hmm. drop them into, mm -hmm. um, you know, rapidly drop them into a very hot climate, for right. example. So this kind of research would be useful there. So can you talk about your research uh, on this and kind of where did it go with, you know, in terms 
as a policy advocate. So essentially started with um, doing four years of research for, for the NCAA. And so we started with college football mm -hmm. and tried to look as, you know, what, where EHIs or exertional heat illnesses occur mm -hmm. and what is kind of a pattern with them. Mm -hmm. And what we found from the NCAA study is most of them occur in the first week. You know, and a lot of them occur on the first couple of days where you're, you're just out on the field and then it kind of spikes down, ebbs and flows with two days and then goes away. So really it's the first two to three weeks that's the most critical okay. uh, in the sport of football. A lot of, you know, and when you think about EHI, it's not just a one-to-one -one relationship between the weather and whether you have a heat illness or not. There are many other things that go into it. Your okay. nutrition, your sleep, how much acclimatization you had, mm -hmm. the intensity of the activity. And that's why I think we see that big spike in the beginning is because that's the first day in front of coaches. So you may train all summer, mm -hmm. right? And you mm -hmm. run all summer, you do all yeah. the stuff. But as soon as you step on that field and your head coach and your assistant coaches are there, it's just a different intensity. You work harder. Right. Right. And so that's why I thought we, why you know, I hypothesize yeah. why we see that spike. Okay. You know, granted the, the environment's part of it, uh, but we saw that big spike there. So when we took that NCA study, we went to the state of Georgia because Georgia had a number of uh, heat stroke deaths and nobody should die from sport, right? So it's A, heat strokes 100%. 100% preventable, proper and efficient recognition treatment. And that's essentially an ice, bud, ice bath mm -hmm. tub. You put them in a big t rubber bay tub filled with ice water and you let you got to cool the body down because someone with heat stroke has a high body temperature and you need to get it back down quickly as possible. Um, and so we work with the state of Georgia and, and you know, I talked about my studies with athletes with disabilities around injury epidemiology. Well, all I did here is take those same injury epidemiology principles mm -hmm. and apply it to a different population mm -hmm. with a different condition. You know, and so it's basically figuring out what's your definition of injury, who's your recorder, how you get to, you know, what data do you need, what are the variables of interest, you know, and to look at all of the uh, potential factors that went into it. Uh, so in working with the Georgia High School Association, uh, we partnered with them for three years and we measured what happened with EHI in, in football. And so it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, after three years of data, we looked at the um, first, first week of practice. And what you saw, if you p took on the uh, x-axis, the duration of practice, and you put on the y-axis, the injury rate, how many injuries you would get. And so for the first two hours, it's pretty much a flat line. Then after two hours, it started to spike up. So what's the policy? Two hours. You, know, yeah. you limit the first week to two hours, and then you go. So with the second week, we looked at it, and it was a flat line for almost two and a half hours. But then it spiked up. So the really neat thing there is you showed a half hour acclimatization, right? For a week. For, from the right, from okay. first week to second week, you okay. saw the athletes. Okay. And so we built the policy around that. And we actually extended that to three hours because mm -hmm. that was a national standard. And so we built a policy based on data and then based upon the sport of football, based upon what we can do in high school and, yeah. and their calendar, and came up with a great policy. And the thing that Georgia really did need, the Georgia High School Association, is they said, okay, Mike, we want to measure what did the rule do? So we just finished three years of post data collection, and we're just starting an analysis oh, neat. now. Wow, okay. So did the policy make a difference? Obviously, we want to know right? that. So, mm -hmm. you know, did the injury rate stay the same? Did it not stay the same? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, were you able to make a difference? One yeah. thing I can say is we had no deaths in the state of Georgia. In that since, period. You know, since 2011 was the last one. Um, but that's good. That's yeah, <laughs> that's really good. Um, <laughs> but at least since the rule's been changed, uh, there have been no fatalities related to EHI. That's, that's great. So that's a hopeful. That's a hopeful sign that so, something is broken. So yeah, if, we, if we talk again in about a, a year from now, I can tell okay. you what the post. All right. Well, we'll have what to. the post data shows <laughs> and, and where it's going. All right. Very good. Um, so shifting gears here a little bit, I saw uh, in 2010 you were a Fulbright scholar. Yep. Now I've heard this phrase and I don't really know much about it. So, what is a Fulbright scholar and what did you do? So. Um, Again, back up a step. Yeah, uh, sure. So from 1998 on, mm -hmm. uh, I got recruited by the National Ath Athletic Training Association to head their international efforts. And so through that, we started the World Federation of Athletic Training mm -hmm. and Therapy, which was kind of a global organization for those involved in athletic training, athletic therapy, sport bio 
kinetics, a whole variety of things that uh, you know, work with athletes. You know, and the world all does it differently. Athletic yeah. training, as we think about it, mostly a North American phenomenon. It's, at the time, it was only U.S. and Canada that athletic training. Now it's expanded. You'll see it in China, uh, not China, um, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Ireland. Uh, we're seeing some programs growing in UK. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing it, the profession grow out. Uh, most of the world uses sport physios or okay. other types of folks to provide athletic training services uh, to their athletes. And so, you know, by being president of the World Federation, I've done a lot of travel yeah. and, in fact, worked with uh, a university in Ireland, Dublin City University. And so Fulbright, got, I was one of the first, in fact, I was the first athletic training person with a Fulbright scholarship. And I did it at DCU, okay. at Dublin City University in oh, Ireland. Neat. Well, and so it was a great learning experience. So, so what I, is that scholarship? What, what, how does one get picked? Well, it's a, it's a national competition, so okay. it's through the government. Okay. And so you submit your application. How many you, go to a year? How many get picked? Uh, nationally, up? wow, that, that's a lot. There are <laughs> a lot there, of, okay, I, I mean, in Ireland, there was uh, about a dozen uh, faculty and students on okay. both levels. I, okay. I, and mine was a uh, research and teaching uh, Fulbright. And so I taught in their athletic therapy program mm -hmm. and did concussion research with them uh, with some of their Gaelic sports. Oh, and, oh really? Okay, yeah. so some other kind of uh, Right, so I did, again, same kind of thing. With, had you worked these kind of sports before? No. Or was this all new to you? Worked, it was new. So oh, I worked with okay. uh, hurling and Gaelic football. Okay. And trying, we were, again, taking uh -huh. the epidemiology. Right. And what does it, you know, what does it show us? What yeah. are the, you know, what are the trends uh, for those particular sports? And we played with a few other uh, evaluation models with them. So it was a combination of teaching and research. And how long were you over there doing that? Oh, about five months. I started okay. in so January and finished at the end of May. It was yeah. tremendous. Uh, and what did you learn from that experience that kind of affected your future research and thinking about whether sports, academics? Well, I think for me, uh, it was more of a personal perspective. You know, I had traveled a lot internationally, yeah. but I never lived in another culture. Okay. And it was neat to become part of the fabric of the culture okay. and of the of the town we live so in. So rather than passing through, you really became right. So mm -hmm. we lived in a town called Clontarf, which okay. is about a half hour north of Dublin, and you know became involved in the different things going on uh, in the community. Came involved in the things that were happening at the university, and then working with the faculty from DCU, mm -hmm. you know, they were teaching me things mm -hmm. that they were doing. I teach yeah. them things that we were doing, and just yeah. blending all of that together had a great relationship with their students because, yeah. you know, it's a different perspective. Okay. Um, and so that was good to hear. And I actually did the year later, uh, we brought students from Georgia over. We did a study abroad okay. uh, at DCU with them. And okay. DCU actually uh, every year sends their students to North America okay. as part of their academic program, which okay. I think is a brilliant model because it's a yeah. semester of inversion, uh, immersion in clinical activities. Great. So. That sounds fascinating. Uh, shortly after you got back then, I, I guess, you kind of switched roles or maybe added a role. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure which it was, but you became the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education. So was that, was that a switch or was that, a, was that, was that a, a, a yet another thing you were doing? So I, w I was in the Department of Kinesiology, which okay. was in the uh, College of Education. And so I got a call from the dean and asked me if I'd be interested in uh, being the associate dean for research. At the time, I was the associate department head uh, for kinesiology. And okay. um, I said, sure, we'll okay. give it a go. We'll, right. see, we'll see what happens and see if, uh, you know, what it's like on the administrative side yeah. of things. Because okay. as director of athletic training, I've been involved in administration and leadership sure. for most of my career. So yeah. this is taking it to... You know, a different level working with the college. Shift in emphasis, right? More towards administration now. Exactly. Okay. You know, much less in the athletic training realm. Um, you know, much less uh, in, in some of the things that I was doing previously. But you were now the associate dean for research. So, what does that mean? What is that's a I think a common position in colleges. Right. So, what does that mean? What Basically, are, what is coordinating all of our research efforts. So, okay. providing um, support services for our mm -hmm. faculty and our mm -hmm. staff. Uh, in terms of grant writing, uh, grant support, submission of applications to various agencies. Uh, we had folks that help proofread uh, grants to mm -hmm. assist our faculty. Uh, we would help in identif identification of uh, granting agencies, either mm -hmm. from the public or private uh, sector or nonprofit sector. And so mm -hmm. it's trying to build that research mission up within uh, the college. And obviously I work with the 
uh, senior vice president for research and, and making sure our mission met up with the university mission. Uh, and you know, just in you know, in the College of Education, we had nine different departments. You know, everyone did something a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, you know, different styles of research, different uh -huh. topics of research. And as a College of Education, we were very involved in educational. Sure. Based research, which for me was a new topic, okay. and so I learned a ton about it. It was okay. fascinating, uh, and and working with our faculty and our staff. So I'm guessing that kind of led to the next thing that kind of happened in your career, which was you became an administrative fellow with the associate provost uh, of the University of Georgia, and you were involved in an uh, in an academic leadership development program right. fellow, or you were. Right. So what were these programs and? And how did you get involved? So this was a program run by the Southeastern Conference, and okay. it was to develop, a, develop the next generation of academic leaders, okay. if you will. And so each school would identify two or three of their emerging leaders. And so I was selected from UGA uh, wow. as one of those folks. And um, it was a year-long program uh, where the campus would be responsible for the majority uh, of the education. A lot of that was teaching us about what happens in the senior administrative side of a university, okay. how budgets work, how mm -hmm. you know the Office of Legal Affairs, public relations, development, etc. Yeah. You know, getting a good overview of the university from a much bigger perspective than what you would see in a college mm -hmm. uh, or department level. Mm -hmm. And then once each semester, we would visit as a group. So all all the fellows from all the universities would converge on the campus and so we were at, at uh, Auburn and University of Kentucky and so they would focus and you know do uh, you know topic and teach us about their campus but obviously the most important thing was the networking yeah, and getting okay. to meet others who were okay. in similar situations uh -huh. uh, most of the people who were involved were, were associate deans or department chairs faculty senate presidents those types of things and so again for me it was it was a nice view to have the bigger picture mm -hmm. of a university, uh, you know, rather than just seeing. So you seeing gleaned some of this. I mean, I mean, having been in a university right. for a long time, you'd gleaned some of this. Of course. But so, so, but what was the kind? What were the big eye-opening moments of that uh, experience for you? Well, I think you know, one was just the budgeting process from yeah. from a university perspective mm -hmm. was um, the public relations communications. Mm -hmm. So one of the things when we did the Auburn trip mm -hmm. is Toomer's tree, which is the big tree okay. that Auburn would go around and would paper the tree following a football win. Oh, okay. okay. And um, that was a time where somebody poisoned the tree. Oh, and so it was shame. a big public relations. Okay. So how do you deal with that? And yeah. how does it work? And, you know, messaging to the public and yeah. whatnot. So, yeah. you know, that, that whole scenario was really interesting. Okay. Uh, we did a big part, which was fascinating. They gave us hypothetical case studies. And, you know, we have to work through as a group on a case study. And, you know, what, what are the facts? And then, what are potential outcomes? Because yeah. everything usually has two or three paths that sure. you can choose. And so why do you choose path A versus B and C? And what's some of the rationale? And then talking through that with the group. So that appears to have uh, been a useful step in your career because in 2013, the University of New Hampshire uh, uh, recruited you to come up here, mm -hmm. uh, where you are currently, as I mentioned earlier, the Kent P. Falb Professor of Kinesiology and the Dean of the College of Health and Human Services. So universities use a bunch of funny titles like mm -hmm. provost and mm -hmm. dean that really don't kind of uh, uh, have a, they probably have a cor something that correlates with them right. on the outside, but people don't use those terms right. outside of academia. So talk a little bit about what a dean is, what a college is, and kind of how does that fit into the bigger picture of the university? So essentially a college is a collection of departments. Okay. And so in our college, in the College mm -hmm. of Health and Human Services, we have eight different Right. Uh, departments, we have two institutes, and we have a number of different uh, centers. And so, you know, in our, in our college, we have Department of Kinesiology, mm -hmm. Human Development Family Studies, we have social work, we have nursing, health management policy, rec management and policy, occupational studies and communication sciences and disorders. And then we have two institutes, the Institute on Disability and the Institute of Health Policy and Practice. And so essentially our college is made of that, and we have a few other parts that are, yeah. are, that are part of it. We have a number of centers as well. But essentially colleges, um, all those different departments, institutes, mm -hmm. and centers. Um, as dean, you know, I'm the administrator for the unit. Uh -huh. you know, we have a great team of department chairs uh, from each of our eight departments and two institutes. We have some folks who works in the dean's office. And again, together, 
we help the college move forward and continue to be in the forefront of teaching our students. Yeah, so one of the priorities that you've uh, kind of established here uh, as dean is to work with uh, external stakeholders, mm -hmm. which kind of goes mm -hmm. back to what you were talking mm -hmm. about, messaging. Uh, and you're, you're working hard to develop partnerships both with kind of government uh, agencies in the area as well as industry. Right. Can you talk a little bit about your efforts well, I, in that I, area? I think it's so important that we be a partner with the community across all different sectors, the yeah. profit, the nonprofit, the hospitals, yeah. you know, et cetera. Um, bottom line is when there, somebody has an issue or problem mm -hmm. they want solved, I want them to think of the College and Health and Human Services first because, again, we, we have tremendous faculty and staff could help solve yeah. those problems. And I wanted to think of us so when they pick up the phone and call and say, hey, can you help us? And we, you know, some cases we'll say yes, yeah. some cases we can't. We don't have the expertise to do everything. Uh, but it's important for us to uh, be good partners mm -hmm. in the state. You know, it's also important for all of our clinical internships, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of our clinical education, for mm -hmm. example, our nursing, occupational mm -hmm. therapy, you know, to have those relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, life is about those personal relationships where mm -hmm. you and I can sit together and we can work through issues and problems. And so by ha developing those relationships and developing those synergies, because I was new to the state and I wanted to learn the most I can, you know, from all of our different partners and to mm -hmm. reach out to folks and say, you know, we, we want to work with you. We want to we be collaborators and partners in a variety of different uh, projects, endeavors, uh, etc. Okay. Do you have an example of anything that's particularly been successful in that? We, we, in that I world? think um, we've developed a uh, nice relationship with the law school for mm -hmm. the health law okay. and policy program, mm -hmm. and so that's another part of us, which is a way. But you know, mm -hmm. that's an example of leveraging our expertise in health policy and practice, mm -hmm. health management and policy, mm -hmm. and a law school, and working together to create mm -hmm. that synergy. Uh, we worked last year in developing a trustees training okay. and working with our hospital associations, you know, doing some basics around hospital trustee training and okay. some of the issues surrounding that. Uh, we're doing some other stuff with uh, our different departments, mm -hmm. you know, around nursing, occupational therapy, uh, um, and you know, because of my background around sports safety, yeah, you know, yeah, with sure. the New Hampshire uh, Athletic Association, yeah. why is it important for the uh, state of New Hampshire to have a a research university like uh, UNH? I mean, why would and not just New Hampshire, but you know, Georgia or sure, so forth? Why, I, why, why I think important? I think we play an economic an important economic piece for mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. You know, a we're training the next generation workforce, mm -hmm. yes. and so our students going out there. But then again, our knowledge that we create through our research, mm -hmm. and then taking that knowledge and translating it into practice, whatever, whether it be a treatment procedure, a new way of analyzing data, uh, a new mechanical design for some piece of equipment, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, you know, those partnerships between education and industry mm -hmm. are so, so important in terms of generating and furthering our knowledge, where, again, whether it be engineering, business, mm -hmm. or, or even health. You know, one of the new programs we're just starting here is the analytics program. You know, you asked an example for, you know, how that partnerships worked. Well, one of the things I heard is we need, we need help in data science. Okay. We have all this data. How, how do we analyze it? You know, yeah. who's the person that does that? So in response to that, we created the uh, Master's in Science and Analytics here mm -hmm. in the Durham campus, and our Manchester campus created an undergraduate program okay. in analytics. So okay. that's creating data scientists to work with big data sets to help identify and solve problems. You know, we're, we're awash in, in data. Yeah, yeah I mean, right, the, the, absolutely. The cell phones mm -hmm. have changed the volume of data we produce, you know, and I think the current stat is every two years we double our data, which is, a, it's a staggering yeah. Yeah. amount. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's a great example of, of a, I think, of, a, of an interaction with, uh, with the community. So what other interesting things are going on in the College of Health and Human Services? Well, I, I think the number, excited about right oh, now? I think that's key. Uh -huh. um, you know, we're working down a number of different initiatives. You know, A is to make sure our, our academic programs are strong and that our graduates are job ready day one. Okay. And so that when they leave and graduate from our programs and they go into a hospital, they go into a clinic, wherever they happen to go, yeah that they're able to do the job right away. And so we want our kids, uh, our students to be ready from the day they go. An example of that is with our nursing program this past year, we invested in our simulation lab. And so we have these uh, mannequins, if you will, that are all controlled 
by computers, and you can run a case on there. You can yeah. do any type of injury or illness and have it change real time, and the student will have to respond to those changes. And these are not like the resuscitanies that, no, that no, no, those no, of no. us that did, did the, the, CPR training a long right. time ago. Th these saw. are things that we can run from a full cardiac arrest to a stomachache. Yeah, yeah. And it's all pre-programmed. and all kinds of things. Right. right? Know, it's and, and the neat thing that we do is, you know, in these rooms we have cameras, and so we videotape the student performance while they're doing their case. So at the end, you can say, you did this really well, this you didn't do so well. And so we could correct mistakes here uh, under our supervision. This yeah. way when they get out into the clinical setting, yeah. they've already learned what to do and how to, how to address those issues. Yeah. And so that'd be an example of having our students job ready day one. So switching gears just a little bit, you know, we continue to see health, wellness going through major changes uh, in our society, both from a policy side as well as from things like, like big data. Right. You know, we're, we're running around with uh, uh, step counters <laughs> on our arms like this, right? And, uh, um, you know, I mean, and we're, ga you know, and so what do you see as kind of big trends? And then we're also seeing really negative things like an obesity crisis, right. um, you know, rising levels of, of uh, lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, created illness. Um, what, what trends do you kind of see as important, you know, as the uh, lead educator for, for the state of New Hampshire on sure. health issues? Sure. So I, I think you touched on it a second ago, was chronic disease. Okay. You know, a lot of those chronic diseases may not be eliminated, but they can be mitigated. You know, so how do you reduce their severity? How do we reduce their frequency? Mm -hmm. Whether it be obesity, diabetes, you know, a whole spectrum mm -hmm. of them. And a lot of times it starts in early childhood education. And so if, can we teach and train people as they move along through the spectrum? Yeah. This when you reach this end, they, ha they have that knowledge. But I think we have to keep our eye on chronic diseases. And not only you know, from a health perspective, just from a cost perspective you know, as well, because we're, you know, we're seeing increased health care costs within our system. I think the Affordable Care Act is changing yeah. some of those costs and the cost mm -hmm. structures. And again, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to interprofessional education, which is another common topic for us, and that's getting different healthcare practitioners working together. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think one of the things we'll see over the next decade is healthcare will become, quote unquote, more of a team sport. Okay. And so if you were to go see a physician, you would go see a physician, and your physician would visit, mm -hmm. be one-on-one -on -one with the doctor, with the nurse practitioner, with the PA, or whoever, and then you would walk out. You know, if we take diabetic care, for example. Mm -hmm. Why can we do diabetic care with 10 people in the room and one nurse practitioner? Forms a team and a bond yeah. among the patients. You know, usually it's a very simple check and you can be much more efficient with it. Mm -hmm. And so I think the efficiencies can, can improve over time, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it's just bridging and bringing everything together. And it's an exciting time in healthcare because you're, you're going to see these changes and from an academic institution, how do we respond to that? You know, so we, we, we want to be in the front end of the paradigm shift, right. not on the back end of the paradigm right. shift. And that's why it's important to do the visits with our external people to know what's on their mind and what they see it's on the horizon. Mm -hmm. This way we can take that information back to our programs and say, hey, here's some of the things that we're seeing. How can we adapt to that from a curricular perspective with our students. You have an advisory board for the college, right? Uh, we have an advisory or board, but it's more of a development board. Development board, right. okay. okay. And so really our, our, our leadership is our department chairs. Okay. And, and our okay. faculty and our mm -hmm. staff. Okay. And they're, and they're reaching out and talking to these. Right. You know, and we share, you know, share that information. We, mm -hmm. we look, you know, again, we look at what's on the horizon and we, we want to be in the front end of that paradigm shift. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we don't want to be the responders, we want rather be the leaders. Right and doing what we can. Yeah. Well, let me, um, let me close on some, some thoughts on, on leadership and mentorship, which I, which I mentioned to you as kind of an area that I'm interested in and that we'll be talking a lot about here on, uh, on The Forge. Uh, and that is, you know, so, you, you, so let me start with one question would be, you mentioned you've got eight departments, mm -hmm. uh, two institutes. Yes, they kind of all share a common interest in health, but I mean, they're very different mm -hmm. animals, right? Um, uh, you've got everything from you know, social work, clinical, mental health, to uh, kinesiology, physical, right. you know, primarily physical health, to administration. And, and they're all teaching students who have different interests. You're an expert in mm -hmm. kinesiology, sports medicine. You probably have some knowledge of all these right. other things. So, but you're the leader for, for the whole organization, right? So how, how, how do you, uh, I mean, you aren't an expert in all those fields. How does that affect your leadership? How does it, 
What, what's the challenge there? Well, I, I, the fun part is learning. Yeah, okay. I mean, to me, that's, that's the joy of what I do, is, mm -hmm. is learning about all the different fields, the different professions, mm -hmm. uh, learning the nuances, uh, the issues that are facing everybody, and then mm -hmm. trying to figure out how we can solve those, and working together. You know, a lot of times, as, like, as I mentioned earlier, just, there's usually more than one solution. And so how do we work together finding the best solution for wherever that problem uh, may be? And so it's, you know, sitting down, analyzing, talking through the different issues, and figuring out what, what is a good path to get where we need to get. I, I think one of the biggest things with leadership is just communication, you know, and, and everything can't be done by email. You know, yeah. So you need to, you know, pick up the tempting. phone. Right, it's tempting. <laughs> uh, but you need to pick up the phone or you uh -huh. need to walk over because you, you can't get into detail uh, on email. Okay. I mean, you just can't yeah. get to the depth of the conversation. Right with that where if you sit side, you know face to face with somebody or if you're on the phone with somebody you can you can move in into those different levels of detail yeah. to have a better understanding of the issues so what do you think uh, what, what have you learned about leadership particularly in the academic environment and what do you think most non-academics don't understand about working in an academic environment, being a leader in an academic I, environment? I think one of the biggest keys is collaboration. Okay. The ability to work across different, work across different departments, different colleges. Mm -hmm. You know, the neat thing about the analytics program, mm -hmm. it's an interdisciplinary program. So it involves all the different colleges and to bring and bridge all that together. And so I think, you know, very much so in academics and, and industry and business as well, mm -hmm is collaboration, is yeah. that cross-pollination of, of bringing people's expertise together. Because mm -hmm. everyone's not an expert on all the topics. Right. 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 right, right. So you have your expertise, but if you could bring experts across five topics into one mm -hmm. room, mm -hmm. you could really develop something great. Yeah. And that's the fun part about it. Yeah. And you know, a lot of parts of being you know, an administrator, no matter what organization, you know, is being the matchmaker, figuring out what parts to go together to, to make something happen. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't, and that's fine, you know, but you, you want the opportunity to try and, and trying to figure out those pieces mm -hmm. to move your organization forward. Okay. You're, the, you're the leader of the college uh, as the dean. How do you see your role in terms of mentorship? How do you see mentorship happening how do you, in, in the college? How important is mm -hmm. mentorship? Both, I would say, so kind of two zones. One would be mentoring our students, mm -hmm. but also within the college, within the faculty, within the staff, right. you know, kind of the mentoring relationships mm -hmm. that are going on there. Uh, what do you, how do you, how is that, how do you encourage it, how, does it, how is it happening, is, is there formal mentoring in the college, is it informal? I, I, think, I think mentoring is an important thing. Okay. I think having those relationships and having those uh, opportunities where if like you would come to me and say, I have this problem, or I have, yeah. I'm thinking about yeah this thing or you know like this program mm -hmm. you, know, you, you brought the program forward to it we thought this is a great idea yeah. you know it's I'm a sorry. way of, of sharing our knowledge mm -hmm. with the public yeah. you know and so seeing those opportunities and working with our faculty and staff mm -hmm. and promoting where we can and supporting where we can you know to me yeah. that is that's the joy of what we do in terms of leadership is developing opportunities for our faculty and our staff to be successful okay. and to do the things that they're passionate about yeah what, what do you really love yeah you know and right. obviously this is a program that you're devoted to and, and that yeah. you love to do yeah. you know if i ask you to do something else you're gonna look at me and you'll probably do it because i asked you to do it right but there's not the passion behind it and that's that's the fun part about mentoring and leadership is finding that passion, you know, lighting that fire and, and allowing it to to glow. So, do you say you've had mentors in your history, mm -hmm. in your past that did that for you? Yeah, as I mentioned, Kent uh, Scriber was mm -hmm. one. The name of my professorship, Ken Fob, was another. Okay. Uh, there were a variety of people throughout the, you know, my career have played uh, good mentoring. My probably the biggest were just my parents. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mom and dad, as you know, as I was growing up and. Yeah. It's just been, you know, it's a series of learning lessons. You know, everyone makes mistakes and it's learning from those mistakes and, you know, moving forward and being honest about it. Yeah. I mean, it makes no sense to, you know, if you make a mistake, make a mistake not to admit it. You know, yeah. be the first one to say, you know, I messed up and here's why I messed up and we'll try and, you know, rectify the issue. Excellent. What advice would you give to someone considering a career in athletic training, uh, sports medicine, or academia? I, again, I go back to what I just said, passion. Yeah. I, mean, I, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I love coming to work every day. I enjoy uh, what, I, what I do. I've enjoyed every step of my journey, you know, from my time at you know, Michigan State to Ball State to Georgia, and now here at UNH. You know, it's having that passion 
and having that fire and the love for generally what you do. I mean, that's, that's what makes life fun. Yeah. And, and then it's those relationships and those mm -hmm. things that you build around it uh, that makes it thrilling. Yeah. And so whether it be in athletic training or whether it be as, you know, as, it's as a faculty or a staff member or you know, in business or industry, you know, having that passion for uh, your profession is, is the biggest thing. Yeah, great. So any final thoughts on uh, what you might want to share about the college? Or well, again, I, I applaud you for doing the program. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a, great, uh, it's a great, great way of educating our students, but educating the broader community. You know, health and health care is such a big topic. Yeah, it is. And there's so many different ways, you know, that we can take it. And like I said, my way has just been around sports safety, mm -hmm. which is really a very small piece of the big picture. You know, but all of us have these small pieces, and you, you by doing this program, join all those small pieces, you know, to That's knit awesome. together a bigger <laughs> picture, which I think would be great for, for students and others to learn from. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. Well, thank you so much for the interview today, sir. I appreciate it. Yep. And uh, hopefully we'll have another follow-up at some point in the near future. And you can tell me about your uh, concussion research <laughs> and how it worked out. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll see you again in about two weeks.